Well, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Lancaster Area Woodturners Coffee Hour number 42. Um, it's January 28th, I think, today. Uh, my name is John Kelsey. I'll be your host from Lancaster, PA. Uh, this morning, we're going to have Barry is going to bring us up to date on his amazing spiral jig, which has gotten remarkably simpler and remarkably better. Um, I've got my threading jig. Pardon? This is a new, a new device, a threading jig. I'm sorry. Oh, a threading jig. That's even better. I, I had, didn't understand that. Um, and then I've got a short video to show you that I made the other day on balusters that I think you'll find amusing. And I know Alan Miller wants to talk about some spheres and uh, Charlie Sapp has got some stuff to show. And I think we're going to fill an hour pretty good. So um, if that's okay with everybody, um, I've got the recording on. Go ahead, Barry. Okay. There's yeah. not a lot that is really new here, but it, um, I put together some, I tried try to make an inexpensive jig that would do a nice job on threading. And this was looking at the jig directly down from above. And a feature is that by trial and error, I know that it has to have is, uh, this is first of all, a, an eight thread per inch for a couple of reasons. I tried finer threads and the finer in thread you go, the tighter the tolerances are on the threads you chase to make sure they either, are, they will engage and not be so tight they can't be turned readily, uh, open and closed readily. Uh, and so the eight thread per inch works well for that. And it also happens to be ideal for screwing scroll chucks on and such. Uh, this is about a seven inch long piece of regular one inch eight threaded rod that in fact John Kelsey gave me. And on the left end, I have epoxied on a, uh, a washer that I subsequently turned to make sure it was true because it's really important that your chuck goes up against a, a, a good stop and doesn't just flop around on the thread because they're a little bit loose. <laughs> There's also a lot of Teflon tape involved here because you have to tape up the threads at both ends so it has no play. Uh, the Teflon works well to uh, keep it from having any chatter. Oh. And the kind of the, the center upper portion, you see a little red square there. That's a 1 16th inch spacer. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. It, go, it goes between the thread screw you see uh, at the very top and the uh, the vertical right here that makes the that makes the thread. There's a picture of the jig installed on my lathe. You can see you can uh, you can't see the hold down bolt, but it's bolted to the table so it can't go left or right. And then a couple of wing nuts on a uh, on guides that allow it to travel in and out. I'm gonna make a modification of it that will mount on the banjo post. Uh, but this is what I have for the time being. There's the business thing there. I bought this from uh, AliExpress. It's a six tooth, 60 degree. It's probably right at one inch diameter at the, at the cutting teeth. Uh, carbide inserts, uh, not inside inserts, they're welded on. And it's, it's key to run your lathe at the highest speed it will run. Uh, mine tops out around 3000 RPM and the faster you're cutting, the smoother the cut. The first couple I tried, I ran down around 1800 RPM and it didn't do nearly a good job. Okay, the, uh, the prepared blank, if you will, Whatever your outside diameter is, and you're looking at the mail on the left here, you want to cut it down to about, uh, I show 15, uh, 0.15 there, 150 thousandths of an inch. That's on the radius. You're going to be cutting it down uh, basically about 0.3 on the diameter. And like with any thread, you want to put relief at the root and the outer edge. You only really have to have about one and a half turns of thread, uh, any more turns of thread and you're screwing the lid forever to put it on. Mm. 
and the actual threaded form, whether you're doing a, an in, a, a centerpiece in a, a larger vessel or something, or just a regular lidded cup, the diameter that you want to turn the male threads to is going to be whatever it's going to be. And it, you, you turn it, and it measures, whatever it measures out to be for the female, cut it smaller than that by one eighth of an inch. Um, and that's for eight thread per inch uh, thread pattern. That'll give you about a 50% engagement uh, on your threads and it runs free and doesn't, doesn't jam at all. And here's the video of, and I'm running at a lower RPM here. This is right around uh, 1200 and 1800 RPM. And if you rotate it, the threaded rod as it is retreating. And I'm starting at the root here because you want to always be uh, 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 going in that direction so you're not climbing into the grain and having to spin the thing off on you. The nail thread is always going to pose the official if you want to start at the root and work your way out. And I'm cutting about 50% of the, the thread there. It works best to do it in two passes. Is, it, is there a reason you start at the back instead of the front? Uh, mainly because, just because I, I thought if I was good, there, there is no good reason, but it, either way it requires starting at the root. Uh, I thought I'd have the best visibility of depth cut from there, uh, but you can do it from either face. But it doesn't change the requirement that you do it from the root out, wherever you put it. It's going to cut in the same direction. It's going to have the same cutting tendency. And here you see a second pass, and I am violating what I just said because we're only cutting off about maybe seven or eight thousandths of an inch now. I also learned there's almost no domestic hardwood that works that takes threads well. This is young, made a similar box to Swedish young that was great. Barry, after the sound finishes here, tell us that again. We couldn't hear you over the water. That was better. I want to know about what you learned about wood. Locust, locust is the best. I'm not, I have not tried uh, off the mainstream hardwoods. I have tried holly and uh, in fact the inserts in this box here are the stripes you could see that was laminations of uh, uh, boxwood. I don't know how an entire boxwood piece would turn. Uh, I I made a threading. I made a threading jig also, and uh, similar to yours. But I find out that locust cuts really nice. I'll have to, uh, an an another American species that's prevalent south of the Mason-Dixon is dogwood. Works yeah. just as nice as boxwood, and yeah. was used extensively by uh, yarn mills to make bobbin shuttles because it wouldn't stain thread, and it's very durable. But uh, uh, also a good practice would is to use MDF and soak it with water thin super glue. Yeah, you know, this one here, I, uh, something I didn't mention was after I did the first pass, I uh, took a brush and cleaned the little residue out and put uh, CA, uh, wiped the coat of CA on the, or brushed the coat of CA on the threads and let it penetrate in and hardened it and then recut uh, and that helps a lot. Now the female threads uh, require no help at all. I guess it's because of the cutting geometry with the wood. The female threads uh, are no problem and don't tear out at all. It's only these male threads and I guess it has to do with the, uh, the unsupported crest of the tooth. Barry is the, this is Alan, is the uh, Chuck at 
right angles or is the angle slightly offset? You know, that's something I was thinking about just this morning. It is not offset. Um, and in, in thinking about what we have is an analogy of if you have a table saw and you're making a cut on the wood. And if you were trying to slide that wood slightly left or right as you pushed it through the blade, you had either the left or right side of the tooth of the saw blade rubbing against the wood and trying to tear it. And that is analogous, the cutter in here is analogous to a very small saw blade. Uh, and the helix angle, of course, the smaller your diameter of, of your job, if I was cutting like a, an inch and a half inside diameter jar, it would become a lot more problematic because of how the helix angle of the thread uh, isn't being compensated for. And so a, a proper jig should be adjustable over maybe a quarter degree to half a degree angle to accommodate so that you're cutting parallel to the thread groove and not right. perpendicular to the axis, if you will. Well, when I made that jig a few years ago, I couldn't get it anywhere near that accurate. And I couldn't get the slop out of it. It had more slop than that, which is why I, uh, I abandoned the project. So I'm really interested that you got this so tight. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I, when I redo it for mounting on a, on a banjo, I'm gonna make it so it, uh, I gotta figure out if it's, if the correct, if the correction should be like uh, left, right, or up, down, to compensate, I think it should be since I'm cutting on the center line, the compensation should be so that the uh, the the box is tilted down or tilted up uh, hmm. versus tilting it clockwise or counterclockwise. Hmm. But that that is a great question and something just occurred to me this morning on what how it could be refined. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Barry, Barry and John. Uh, if you wanted to, you could use a uh, standard hex nut. But what you could do is drill or cut a slot in it and use a kind of a screw or a threaded uh, bolt to squeeze the nut tight on the threads. Yeah, I've tried that, Ernie. I, I'm sure I, I've done that, Ernie, and uh, it does help. The problem is, uh, as long as you are using hardware, like, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot grade rod and nuts, they are, uh, there are little burrs and high spots on them. And so you really They're have sloppy. to uh, take the threaded rod and mount it on a, a lathe and run it at low speed with a, uh, a file and clean the, the teeth up so that it runs smooth. Because when I've tried clamping down on the nut, it was actually a connector nut, which is like about an inch and a half long. When I tried clamping down on it, uh, it, it caused, I'll say, irregular friction. So it, it took out all the slop, but it's, it made it so it was hard to turn sometimes and then easy to turn other times. Huh. Yeah. So a, a, a lot of thread cleanup. And by the way, I have a, a much more exotic jig than this for doing the same thing but I couldn't claim it to be inexpensive. It was it is homemade, but it was specialty hardware that I was given by somebody. But it, uh, it has no play. It runs on uh, axial bearings uh, and, uh, and pillow blocks. And it has no play whatsoever and it runs exactly concentric. But there's, if you were to buy the parts that I was given, you're looking at probably about 150 bucks. Here the real cost is that little cutter uh, even from China, I think it was like $18. Uh, the American version like John has by the, a company called Moon, M-O-O-N. Uh, just like this, but it's not carbide. Uh, it has more teeth uh, and it's about 40 bucks. Yeah, that's what I had. And there are refiners that could be made, not so much to the, the jig, but I'm preparing the blanks so that you can avoid if you have if you have beautiful grain configuration with a lot of movement on it. When you cut out when you lose the half inch for the narrow thread, it's hard to get an exact match. 
and you close the back truck. Uh, even if you get it right back to its original position, there's that half is missing. But there can be a lot of brain changing going on in there. And so I have uh, done one box that the technique of placing an all epoxy uh, thread on the male end so that the only wood you're losing visibly is about a sixteenth of an inch with a narrow first uh, cutting tool to separate the wood from the tape. You can kind of see on the bottom of the image there are these female teeth cut really nice. And this is the same kind of wood. So, so Barry, um, what would happen if you use that tool on your um, spiral jig and use a uh, use this um, spiral jig completely horizontally, um, like the same cutting angle but off center with the and reverse the wood and the and the tool? Yeah, they are. Um... I guess my only immediate issue when I when I thought of that is that this uh, at least this Chinese tool that I bought, the shaft on it is not an American uh, diameter, it's 10 millimeter. And oh. so it's not three eighths and it's not half inch. And so the collet on a router uh, can't accommodate it. Uh, and so I, I didn't go that route. Uh, and also the using the uh, threading or the spiral jig is too coarse of an action uh, when you, you know, it's, a, it's advancing at, uh, at a minimum of probably about a uh, three degree helix or something. And it's just, it would put on like a, at this diameter right here, it would put on like a four threads per inch or three threads per inch which then you'd have to make multiple multiple passes so that you have a equal tooth and gap separation. But but it but if you put it made it so that your um, spiral jig had a lot tighter um, uh, tighter diameter change, you could do it. Is what you're saying? It's just a matter of making sure the ratio is right. And also the uh, the spiral jig can tolerate a little bit of chatter. Yeah. This, uh, yeah. The, this device here can, I mean, this job here can't tolerate any chatter at all. Um, yeah. That's another reason why you want to run the highest speed you can. You want to get away from any of the harmonics of the, of the piece you're running. And um, in this case here, I had the lid on a small chuck and I had the base on a, a larger, uh, uh, a heavier, about a six pound chuck. And so the harmonics of the two are different, but if you go up around 3000 RPM, you're pretty much staying away from the chatter zones uh, that are gonna amplify by the natural, the natural frequency of the wood. It doesn't, doesn't a, uh, um, a router go at a lot higher speed? It does, and that, that would be, that, that is the argument for, uh, for the router. If you're looking at uh, 22 to 28,000 versus like 3000, now on the plus side here, this thing having eight, <coughs> teeth, this cutter having eight teeth is a nice multiplier for a, a typical router only has two, in some cases three. And also I could not find a router bit that had the, uh, the 60 degree cutter. It would require a, maybe a tool like Ray Simmons has for his, uh, as far as a you know, ground on demand kind of thing for a fly cutter to get the right geometry in your cutter. Thank you. I guess we've already shown this one. Yeah. Okay, and then, then here's a, a second pass do you have any trouble re-indexing it for the second pass, or does that work okay? No, it, what's of most importance is do not move the bait. Once you have started, once you're ready to make your very first cut, male or female, do not move the bait uh, throughout that cut uh, to, to do a chip fit 
I threw it away from the cutter all the way so I can then slide it. Um, I can slide it up toward my belly to get it free of the cutting head so I can try and screw on the cap or screw on the base and it will always return to the same place. I mean, I, the, the little uh, threaded bolt on the left, if you look at the center left edge of the picture, you'll see that little red square I was talking about spacing the, uh, the little three eighths uh, threaded rod I have there and that positions its inward position. Um, when, you, when you remove that 16th insert, the cutter should be just grazing on the female surface, not taking anything away, but you can just feel it rub. So that then when you take that little spacer out of the way, um, you are, uh, you're engaging by a 16th of an inch and that's, that's the desired uh, depth for this thread form. Very cool. It is. Very nice. Thanks, Barry. Very, really cool. And I got a... There's the, uh, the finished item. And Very uh, nice. And can you control how it lines up? Yes, you can. You, and you have to trim it to do that, don't you? Right. After when I, and in fact, I, I screwed up here on it. You know, this thing will line up. And I thought, oh, this is great. With this pattern, I can line it up 180 degrees out. The problem is the wood has enough variation that when I got it lined up, I'm, I'm lined up out by 180. You see how the butt base is lighter than the top. Oh, yeah. And if I... If I rotate it around 180, I'm, I thought about making a little uh, 16th of an inch, like a black shim, uh, so that when it's screwed down tight, it, uh, it would be in the proper alignment. And that... Uh... Great show, Barry. Really good, Barry, thanks. That was really a terrific show, Barry. Uh, if you... Uh, ever want to exactly uh, calculate the pitch angle somewhere I have the formula but it's uh, it's, it's calculated at one half the thread height so it would be right yeah. Yeah. that's exactly well actually in this case it's a little bit less just because of the uh, I didn't want to get to any kind of sharp crown on the tooth uh, so I'm using uh, the actual thread height theoretical from a valley to a crest is uh, like, you know, for, it's about 0.866, you know, it's the, the sine of 60 degrees times the, uh, times the, uh, the base. And uh, so a 16th of an inch comes out to be about a 50% engagement. I'm running maybe slightly more than that in engagement, but here's the, here's the box and if I had, Yeah, that's well. That's that's the nice alignment too. It doesn't have to fit tight. That looks great. That looks really. Good. It's nice to have that reveal around there to separate visually separate the top from the bottom. So Very you could, nice. You could glue a little dab it in there and stop it at that point. Yeah, that's what I was. I was thinking about taking some kind of a either black epoxy or black wood, and uh, making a little. I'm sorry. And making a little. Uh, spacer in there that would stand out maybe a 16th of an inch proud so that it would uh, it would close above it i think and it's better that way than close tight it take yeah yeah it takes about uh, i have like one and a half turns of thread here uh, so that's very very nice very nice work barry thank you nice show too barry thanks Thanks. Ray's got his hand up. Go for it, Ray. Hey, Barry. This is, I, this is a box with a, a double lead. This is a double lead eight, which is sixteen threads per inch. Uh huh. I mean, it's hard to see that. If these are cut, um, you don't you don't need an offset with that. But you got to be you got to be square. Um, with your cutter to your piece. So there's no there's no compensation. Otherwise, when you make the cut, you're gonna put the threads on, it won't thread right. 
and a sharp 60 degree cutter. You could, I have them down to 3 16th of an inch, 60 degree cutter, so you can go down real small. So actually the size of the cutter you, and you hit on it as a speed is really important because it makes a nice clean cut um, for how far, how fast you advance that. Um, but uh, what you have to do is, and, and you, you got into the math of it, is cut one piece and that's your final piece. And that's gonna be about 70% of a sharp point. Uh, and you, if you get into the books, you know what that is. And then cut the other one to that and not, and use the formula and you'll find that when you take your second cleanup cut on your second piece, every piece you make uh, comes out the same, if that, if that makes sense. Because it's very hard to say, okay, I'm gonna do this and take, take uh, you know, this much off because the diameter changes the thread the way it fits. So um, if I have a formula for that, if you need that out of uh, machinery's handbook, yeah. and it's it gets gets complicated when you get into the threading. You know that if you're doing any any metal work. Uh, I have machinery's handbook, and that is a uh, well that used to be a step off point. Oh. You can find all that information on there. Uh, and I think everything has to be loosened up a little bit for the, I mean, the, the intimacy of the fit has to be loosened up a little bit. And I tried to take a lot of references from a mason jar. Uh, yeah. Wood ain't plastic is the main thing. Wood ain't metal. It has motion. It moves around. It's not the same. So yeah, you can't do it what, to the same tolerances as you would metal or plastic. Yeah, but what happens with a, with a, a thread like a mason jar, there's a thread missing. Yeah. And that's made so you can get it off fast. So when you use an eight thread, like I use a double lead, so it starts in two places. Well, that's actually 16 threads. It's cut as 16 threads per inch, but it's an eight thread cut. Yeah. So you, cut, you cut eight threads twice. So it changes the depth of your of your threads. So, but when you go to use a do a mason jar, what happens is the bottom. That big gap in there at the bottom, when you put that in wood or metal, the cutter doesn't have a point. So you end up cutting, you cutting the space out for a fast release of the lid. It's really nice when you take something and you do a quarter turn and the lid comes off. So it's like apples and oranges. Yeah. yeah. Mason jars are also a knuckle thread. So that's, you'd have to drive, grind the cutter to a radius. I'm going to uh, move it along now. I think this is a great discussion and I'm going to separate it out as a separate discussion in the recording from the hour. Um, I'm going to give you a quickie plug for the Lancaster Woodturners meeting next Tuesday night at uh, starting at seven. So we'll be on at 630. Uh, Jim Laporte is going to show us what he's learned about making molds for ceramic. And we're talking hobby, not industry, uh, using the lathe to turn a wooden mold and then using that, to a wooden pattern rather, and then using that to make a mold that you can cast ceramics in. So that'll be the uh, topic. Oh. The other thing for Tuesday night is the, uh, the, the challenge is a ball and socket. And I know a bunch of guys are working on that. Um, and we're planning to have a little impromptu interactive live remote demo tomorrow morning at nine on this same link to uh, talk about balls and how to turn balls. I've got some demo stuff and it'll be very informal because we're going to try the interactive live part. So anybody who'd like to check in tomorrow at nine, please join us. And on that, I'm going to show you a quickie video that I made and then I'm going to give the floor over to the floor. So let's see, first I got a share screen. I'm gonna share this one. Oh, we're gonna make a model spindle. This is a oh, half size, third size, somewhere in there of what's gonna be balusters for a veranda. Here's some of the turned balusters I spotted around Lancaster County for a slideshow I presented to the Woodturners Coffee Hour about a couple of weeks ago. These are some of my favorites and some of the ones that were the most interesting. And from the art world, the humanoid bill bouquets of the surrealist Magritte. I like to make sketches of what I'm going to do, but I don't uh, draw really well. It's just little doodles on my sketchbook. 
This turned out to be the key drawing. It shows the cannon form in two orientations, how the ball could move on a wave, and also a plausible bead and pommel detail for the top and bottom of the baluster. Techniques I'm about to show you allow you to model any kind of baluster that you can imagine, really, using a few simple parts of the minor, mostly made out of cherry. And in a minute, I'm going to show you how to turn them, and then we'll get back to more design experiments later in the video. Skew chisel. in the roughing gouge. Find the center to locate the ball. General purpose bowl and spindle gouge with a 40-40 grind.
Hey, John, was that just poplar you were using? No, it's, it's almost all cherry. Is that a new skew, John, or is it a German skew like Kai was showing before? It's the German skew like Kai was showing. I bought one of those at Rally a couple of years ago, and I like it very much. I've been learned, I'm, my goal in this is to learn how to turn the whole spindle with the skew. Okay. So anyway, that I wanted to show you, and any comments, and then we'll go on to the next guy. John, what, my comment is I, I, we often do balusters as a demonstration at the Gosnopin Folk Festival, and I'm wondering if that, late, that video is available I could send to my son. Certainly. I'm going to post it on YouTube later today and send out the link. Thanks. Okay. Um, I know that Alan Miller had something he wanted to go to. Alan, are you there? I'm here. And uh, let me go ahead and let's see. I'll share screen. And then uh, go there. Uh and large. Yep, you're looking good. Okay, we'll start the slideshow. Well, there we go. Okay, uh, a couple of weeks back, I talked about my lathe conversion. At that point, I was having trouble with the digital attack. I did get that working. Uh, and the major problem was that uh, with a cheap Chinese digital tack, you get uh, almost nothing by way of uh, wiring instructions. And I had used one wiring diagram I found online, and that was uh, uh, the wrong one. I eventually found another one, and now it's working very well. Uh, I also got one up on my uh, drill press, and uh, that means I avoid having to change belts to get my varying speeds. So just two updates there. Uh, next, yes. Hang uh, on. Also, uh, yo. Um, I'm not getting your screen, screen share yet, Alan. Has it started? Uh, are you, uh, is anybody else having problems with a screen share? No. no. Yes, I am. No. no. Uh, is it a problem on a cell phone? I think I heard somebody say that before. Cell phones are very difficult. No, I haven't had any other problems today. It's just saying Alan Miller has started screen sharing and it's not showing, it's showing me just your face and then the face. So it hasn't actually shared the screen. Okay, let me see if there's any spotlighting. Oh, there, there it goes. There it goes. Everybody got him now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there was the first one. These Here's the second made, one. Shop made speed controls. Yeah. Uh, it's a drill, a um, tre treadmill motor conversion, and then I put the digital tack on, uh, and yeah, it's infinitely variable. The uh, treadmill motors are two horse, uh, and I've got a forward reverse switch on both, and they they seem to be working reasonably well. So I'm I'm glad for those updates. Then uh, the last time, this is the same bowl I showed uh, three four weeks ago. At that point, the inside was very rough and I was very unhappy with it. A number of you made suggestions, uh, including uh, sharper chisels. I was able to rework it and I'm uh, uh, grateful for your suggestions. And uh, it still has just a little bit of roughness there you see on the upper left-hand corner, but uh, on the whole, it's a, a much cleaner uh, project than what it was. And that's the upside down of that one. Nice work, Alan. Then uh, I turned a little pine box. I wanted to put a lid on it. Uh, after I turned the lid, I did not like the, uh, the way the cedar went with the pine. So I painted it. <laughs> Works. Very nice. And added the little finial on top. What kind then, of thing? What kind I'm of sorry? Paint? What kind uh, of paint? Uh, rattle can, uh, black spray paint. Okay. And then, uh, as part of the challenge for this month, why we were asked to do a ball and a socket, uh, I've been working on my uh, the balls. The first one there that I worked on, uh, that silver maple, it's about an inch and a quarter. 
and on the whole, I got that reasonably well. Uh, there's one small bump on it. Uh, I'm especially interested in hearing what folks have to say about jam chucks. Uh, there, I made one that was a sleeve that I put on the tailstock, and the other one, of course, is the insert in the scroll chuck. Uh, that's the way I make balls. So that's what I was going to show you tomorrow. So you don't even need to attend. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm still I'm still interested in hearing it and seeing what other people do with jam chucks. Uh, that one part of the difficulty was that um, it was leaving scorch marks on the ball. It, it wasn't always or, or indentations on the ball. And, and there's there's going to be my uh, entry submission for Tuesday evening, uh, a little ball and cup toy. Um, there is the, uh, and that was a pine one. I was somewhat pleased with that. Uh, that one measures about two inches and uh, using the calipers after I was done, I had a variation of a 32nd of an inch, but uh, on the whole, it came out well, but there again, because it was pine, um, I was getting the the impressions of the jam chucks. Uh, now I, I do have some well, two th two problems I had. One was the impression of the jam chucks. I put these little rubber pieces in, but then I was not getting a good centering. Uh, I would get a little bit of a wobble every time I turned it. Uh, so that, that's my that, that's what I have. And, and any comments or suggestions people would have on. Uh, how to good, get good, clean, uh, no wobble when you turn the ball. Is that your last slide? That's my last slide, yep. Have you tried, uh, Alan, have you tried uh, jam chuck with a slightly larger diameter on the, on the um, um, tail stock? On the tail stock, yeah. Uh, that was a thought. Uh, the other, yeah, uh, that was one thought I thought also about trying to make it more like a, a funnel as opposed to just a round circle there. Well, I, I went and got out some that I made oh, a couple of years ago that I had been using and I put them back in the lathe and bloody hell, even though I index, you know, the number one jaw, they don't run true. Um, so what I learned is you got to turn this again every time or make a new one every okay. time. You can't, if something okay. you made two years ago to make a ball with is not going to run true now. Jam checks are extremely ephemeral. Um, even breaking for lunch can knock them out of true. But if, if you use an armrest to make them, it's pretty quick work. Anybody else on this? We'll stay on plan and get together tomorrow at nine on this same link just to kick around sphere turning because I'd, I'd like to try the interactive remote demo part. So anybody who's willing to put up with <coughs> around with cameras is welcome to join us. Um, so, so just a quick question, John. The jam chucks that you guys are talking about is making round is on the on the on the drive end and not the spindle end. Is that correct? I did it on both. I, I know you did it on both, but but getting the jam chuck centered correctly on the on the uh, drive is um, more critical than on the on the um, tail stock end, you. isn't it? Well, I can tell you that what the German fellows do, uh, Weissflog and his son, is they make a they turn the ball by eye and then they make a jam chuck that holds half the ball, so there's no tail stock. So you've got half. Oh, okay. The ball okay. The chuck. So that's turning a basically a socket that the ball will pump in with to with your fist, and then you have to hit it this way to get it out again. But I don't know how to do that. I've just seen them do it. Okay. If, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's my playlist for Woodworkers Journal. And there's a video turning a croquet ball, which I show the whole process. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Ernie. Send me the link to that, Ernie. I'll put that in the uh, follow-up. Uh, all right. I'll do that as we speak. All right. Um, Charlie, you had something. I have something, yes. So uh, I have, I'm, I'm turning some uh, just cherry bowls and uh, I had some cracks in the bottom and, and I was just asking your opinion if you guys throw this in the firewood pile or you fill in the cracks like I did and uh, just keep moving on. 
you know, and then if you just do keep it, do you put your name on it, even though it, there's imperfections <laughs> to it? Or, uh, you know, what, what did you, you guys? What did you fill them with? Well, at first I used CA glue. And then uh, after I was done turning, there was still some voids. And I mixed uh, some sawdust with uh, white Elmer's glue in there. But you, are now enter you are now entering the great debate. <laughs> of wood turners, half right. of the people on the show would throw it out, and the other half would say, "Sign it." So, <laughs> yeah, so, that, that's where I'm at, you know. So uh, I don't it's know not a flaw; done. it's a feature. Exactly. You know. So what's the, it look the, on? On Is the, the flaw inside, on the other side. See the crack over here? That filled oh. in pretty nicely, you know, yeah. and stuff. And then I had one on the outside that filled in pretty nicely, also. And since these bowls are about 13 inches in diameter, I, I you know, it was too good of a size to uh, just throw away. That's I a thought. nice looking bowl. I would, I'd live with it. I'd sign it. I'd be happy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, and then I have another one. Oh, let me just grab it here. The same thing happened, you know, you could see the crack on the bottom, you know, and uh, I had the tenon and I was concerned that the tenon was going to break off. So I filled it in with epoxy before I, returned it and uh you know it was through a little bit on the bottom not really much you know and uh was able to return it again and stuff you know i'm happy with the way they came out except i have the cracks on the bottom which are imperfections a couple of comments no. on the cracks uh what i've been doing on a couple of pieces is use a biscuit joiner and put little biscuits in there of different contrasting wood across the cracks. right uh -huh. That'll help a little. Yeah, I thought on if it was on the side, I would do that as a little autistic thing, but on yeah. the bottom of it, you know, yeah. I yeah, don't it know. It makes it look like at least you tried to fix the crack. You recognize <laughs> it was there and you try to fix it. Right. Uh-huh. It's so uh so that was my question, you know, and which way you guys would go, you know. I'm not a production turner, so I had I have the time to fill in the cracks and stuff, but uh you know, is it something that you put <clears throat> as a gift, you know, to a friend or something or a family member, knowing that it's not perfect, you know? Not only not only can you say it's not perfect, I've actually sold a lot of pieces of bowls that had cracks that were filled into it because the buyers liked the fact that the crack was highlighted or somehow okay. changed into a feat and into a feature. So there are right. people that prefer just playing with no cracks. They won't take it, but there's lots of people that really look at that as an artist, your artistic um, signature on the wood because right. you've thought about what to do with it. I know right. one fellow who fills them in with red or blue epoxy. So yeah. yep. really uh -huh. makes a feature out of it. Right. Yeah, huh. I do. Yeah, I've used malachite. Malachite was pretty nice to work with. And stuff, you know. So, and I, and I've used, I've also used um, metal powders. You're right. All, all, uh -huh. all sorts of things. So, right. So, uh, from there, it was like since I've been making these bowls, I was like, why don't I try to make some fruit? So, uh, still got the stem to do on this one here. Just like Charlie, and, put the camera back on you. Okay. So, uh, I wasn't really too happy with the shape you know and stuff it just looked too small and stubby up on top so i went to the store and actually bought a pair and uh kind of had a visual of it you know instead of a picture and uh this is out of cedar and i'm a little bit happier than this one over here you know with it and stuff so so that's what i did yesterday you know played with some fruit and stuff uh another thing i was going to mention to you is uh I've watched a couple of uh, Zoom meetings from Wrecked Power Tools. Have you guys been uh, watching any of those? No. So yes, I have. Was promoting those. Excuse me. Susquehanna Club was promoting those. Okay. They're very right. beautifully done. Very they seemed pretty good. Shot. They were interesting. Yeah, they're very beautifully shot. Yes. Yes. Great, Great camera. camera. For high resolution. Yeah. Right. And Theo is very entertaining. So he's talking all the time, nonstop. 
the Australian and demonstrator they have. So you're familiar with that stuff? Yeah, I watched some of the um, the um, remote demos as well. They have them for Britain, and then they are at 11 o'clock in the morning for, for Germany. The ones they do for Canada and the US are just in the middle of the night for us, so it's too late. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, I have something. Okay, you said that we can show works in progress. I think the base of this, um, I showed you uh, maybe six weeks ago. Uh, there are 48 segments to the, um, to the carving sections. Uh, the top is is not my final shape. I think what I'm going to do is um, make uh, lancet, lancelet uh, shapes coming down here and then uh, work a little bit on here. I don't know if I'm going to put in any kind of decoration up here. Now what I use is uh, an Axminster uh, set for long long hole boring they call it and you can uh it provides the cutter for making the the mortise you make your own tenon and if they fit together real nicely you can actually um use the holes and remount them on the mandrels, which I'll show you now. This is what you use uh, in your long hole boring. Can you hold it up a little higher, please? It's good cut off, at least on my screen. Thanks. Uh, this point is removed when you bore. Uh, boring a long hole used to be uh, a source of tension for me, but with this system, it's it's a foolproof. Uh, diameter is the hole that you can bore. What? Is there a limit on the diameter of the hole? Yes, there is. Um, these are, this one is made specifically for, um, I think, lamps. So it's uh, whatever diameter that hole is that you'd use to. Uh, so 5 16 3 8. Your heart fitting in. Yeah, I think it is that. Lamp rod's half inch, so it'd be just over that. So uh, here is what you use to make the mortise. So, sorry, this is what you use. You mount it on here to make your mortise. Hmm. So I found that to be an excellent system. Axminster has an excellent um, video on how to do it. So yes. it's just something that I recommend. Where can you get Axminster in this country? Uh, they ship to the US. They provide you with the dollars. Um, you can the pay wood turning dollars. store. You can pay in dollars and it's no problem for them. Uh, they do charge uh, $20 to uh, postage, handling, and customs. Uh, but if you're buying the whole set, I think it's it's very worth it. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, the wood turning store on Long Island uh, just started carrying uh, Axminster. Uh huh. Okay. Now I did try um, Packard. Packard has. Um, these components minus the uh, holes that this these allow the chips to fly out when you're boring the hole. Uh, John, you don't have me highlighted. Okay, these these holes allow the the chips to fly out as you're boring the hole. Uh, the Packard set doesn't have that. Also, the Packard uh, tools come dull. I even had to. Uh, sharpen the spur uh, on the Packard set. 
So Axminster comes everything sharp along with um, the chip ejector. So I'd much more highly recommend the Axminster set than the Packard. What's the depth of the long hole that you can bore? What's the, ma what's the maximum reach? Uh, the length of your, your, your drill. Uh, mine, uh, it could easily be, let's see, this is about, I'm guessing about 20 inches. So the system is the, the parts you showed center the workpiece between the headstock and the tailstock, and then you send the drill bit through the tailstock into the workpiece. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I've made this in uh, four sections. Part of that is so that if I make a mistake on one section, it's not too hard to replace. Well, why are you hiding the join in a, in a prominent place? I, I can't quite see the detail. Is the join there down in a groove or is it on the high point of the curve? Ask that again. Show the join between those parts. Okay, now put it together. Okay. What's the final detail gonna be at that point? Uh, I was thinking I'd probably just leave it like this. So it's a, a small groove. Uh, it's actually, I think uh, the tenon is a wee bit long, maybe a, a 16th too long. If I shaved off the, uh, oops, uh, the rough edge around here probably would fit uh, very closely. I guess my question is, are you going to try and hide the join or are you going to feature the join? Um, it would be like this. So it, it just fits very closely. So I just leave it like that. Cool. Thank you. I'm you going to have a a suggestion for that? You think I should put some kind of... No, I don't have a suggestion. I just have a question. It's on the same order as do you feature the cracks in the bottom of the bowl or do you pretend, pretend they're not there? Do you feature the join between the parts or do you may want to make it look like it was turned as one piece? Uh, but I don't know the I don't have an answer. Uh, it's a question. I think it, it'll look like one piece. Okay. Any comments on this? I will say something else about uh, it's really handy to have these mandrels on both ends. The first thing you do on a piece of wood is is make the bore so that thereafter you can always just put it between the mandrels and you'll uh, stay true to your shape. <laughs> Uh, we're coming up on 11, so I'm going to call this um, officially over. Um, if you'd like to stay on and chat, you're welcome.